Hi, my name is Joey Accardo, Technical Manager for EpiRock Surface and Exploration Drilling in the USA. In this segment, we're going to be covering how to remove and replace a striking bar or shank adapter, and a few tips and tricks about things to look for when doing so. You're going to need a handful of tools as well. In this case, we've got a rag to catch any oil spillage and a bucket down below that. We've got a 32 millimeter socket and ratchet, and we'll also need a torque wrench to accompany that for reinstallation and an 18 millimeter socket and ratchet to remove the connecting plate bolts on the back side of the flushing housing. The first step after securing the work area is to remove the nuts from the sidebar. I like to loosen them up but leave them attached for the next step. Next, we're going to remove the four bolts that retain the flushing hose to the back side of the flushing housing. After removing the four bolts from the connecting plate for the flushing hose, it may be necessary to use a small pry bar to gently relieve the pressure from the hose and to remove the flange. We want to be careful not to pry in any sealing surfaces. Once this is removed, we can just set it aside. After removing the connecting plate and loosening the nuts but leaving them installed, we want to remove the flushing housing and shank adapter together. There are a few moving pieces there, so it's best to leave the nuts so that it doesn't come flying off and drop parts on the ground. So to do that, we can simply wiggle and slide, and sometimes we might need to use a hammer, not our hands, to tap to loosen things up and to keep them moving. Once we get to the point where we're going to be removing the adapter and shank complete, we need to be ready to carry the weight. I like to move anything out of the way from below there. The next step in removing the shank adapter is to make sure that all of the pieces are accounted for, the o-ring is intact, and that the stop rings are present, and to inspect their condition. Everything on this one looks okay, but we do have some wear to talk about here. We're going to use a pick to gently remove the o-ring so as not to damage it, and then that will loosen up the stop rings to allow them to be removed. First we need to move the shank adapter backwards in the housing to do that. In this case, as you can see, these flushing seals are quite tight and the shank will not move freely. So we'll need to use a hammer to provide some tapping. Holding the flushing housing, we can simply tap on the end of the shank adapter. And that will knock the stop rings loose. At this point, we have another O-ring to remove. We can remove this O-ring and the stop rings will come out. They're a matched set, but they can only go one way, so we don't have to be too concerned with their position. We're going to set those aside, in our case for reuse, but they could also be replaced. Next, we're going to remove the shank from the flushing housing. Removing the shank adapter from the flushing housing is simple. We hold in place and tap it through. Be mindful of where the other end is going though, so that we don't hammer it into something or cause it to fall on the ground. Once it's loose like that, we can simply remove it by hand, and from there we can get a new one, or we can reuse this one in this case. Before installing the shank adapter, it's always a good idea to make sure that all the seals are in good condition, and now is a good opportunity to replace them if need be. In our case, all of the mating surfaces are clean, free of debris and rust, and all of our seals on the body of the flushing housing are intact. Next, we're going to reinstall the shank adapter or install a new shank adapter. When doing so, I like to apply a little bit of lubricant, assembly oil, rock drill oil, any of these will be fine, just to prevent the seals from dragging. At this point, we're going to reinstall, making sure not to damage the seals, and we'll press in. 
In the event that we can't press the shank in by hand, it's okay to use a soft faced hammer and to tap in the anvil area. However, we would never want to use a metal hammer here. We want to stop at this position so that we can reinstall our stop rings. But before we do that, we want to have a look at them to make sure that there's not extreme pitting or galling. We'll see some signs of heat and chipping. This can be normal. However, we don't want to see extreme wear here. Nothing should be sharp, and if it is, contact your local EpiRock service center or distributor partner. We take the stop ring halves, place them gently like that, and then we can install the O-ring. It can be tricky sometimes, but it'll go on. It's important to make sure that the part facing the shank adapter is matching and that the stop rings are even. It can be inserted incorrectly, however, the housing will not mate up to the rock drill if that's the case. Once the stop ring is in, we need to make sure that it's seated. To do this, a soft face hammer can come in handy and simply tap the shank adapter. and then the stop ring will seat. We can take the next O-ring. That was the first one we removed. In our case, we're reusing this one, so we're going to clean it and make sure that it's in good condition. It is, so we're just going to place it back on there. And now we can go back to the machine to reinstall the assembly. Before reinstalling the shank adapter assembly, one thing we do want to look at is the condition of the driver and the chuck. It's important to make sure that the chuck is installed the correct way as damage can result if it's installed backwards. We want to make sure that the curved face of the chuck is resting on the shank adapter in a natural way. You don't need to remove this, but I like to remove it, inspect for cracks, chipping, or other signs of damage, and address them before they become a major failure. Then we reinstall the driver, and we can now install the main assembly. When installing the assembly, it's also a good idea to make sure that the small seals that are placed on the sides don't get pinched, cut, fall out, or go missing. If you're having trouble keeping them installed, you can also use a bit of grease to help cement them in place. Then we're going to lift the assembly, install and align the splines, make sure all of our fingers are clear, at that point we can slowly slide on. Right before I install completely, I always check again to make sure that the dowel pin is present and that all of our small seals are in place and everything looks good. Now we can slide it the rest of the way on. Sometimes that requires tapping with a hammer and then we can tighten the nuts. It's always a good idea to install the assembly and get it nearly seated prior to installing and tightening the nuts. We don't want to use the nuts to draw down the housing. If it was off-centered, this could lead to damage of the mating surfaces. After installing the assembly, we then want to make sure that we put the washers and that they're the correct washers. If you do not have the correct washers, stop immediately and get assistance from your local distributor or EpiRock service center. We then want to apply a never seize compound to the threads to prevent galling or corrosion in the future, as well as to make sure that the torque specification is maintained. Once that is applied, we can hand thread the nuts into place, and then we can begin the torquing sequence. After installing the nuts finger tight, we can then utilize our torque wrench to torque to the final torque spec of 350 newton meters. It's always a good idea to check the manual. This is on an SC25 rock drill, and the specification is 350 newton meters. We want to achieve that torque, however, uniformly and by alternating. So as we go up, we'll achieve our final torque value. This makes sure that everything is even. Once the main nuts are torqued, 
We can then reinstall the flushing housing connecting plate. In this case, we want to make sure that the O-ring is in good condition and then reinstall. After installing and torquing the nuts, their final torque, then we want to reinstall the flushing housing connecting piece. It's a good idea to make sure that the surface is clean and free of debris on both sides. After that, we locate the plate and install it by hand. After installing the plate, we then want to clean and inspect the bolts and apply a light coating of never sees. It's a good idea as well to make sure that the retaining washers are in place. After starting one bolt, it's a good idea to leave it loose while aligning the rest. And once all four are aligned and installed, we can then tighten to final specification. After installing all four of the bolts, we're going to torque them to specification in an alternating pattern. Once all of the bolts have been torqued to specification and everything else in the area checked, it's time to clean up our tools and the job is complete. After tightening all of the bolts and nuts, it's time to clean up our tools. It's not a bad idea at this point to check the strainer that is on the rock drill oil recovery line, as well as the relief valve that's found up here. And as always, if you need further assistance, reach out to your Epiroc Service Center or dealer.